having a talk on possibilities of conflict between the United States and Iran. And in some respect, it would be terrific if nobody showed up, <laughs> because that would reflect all of your collective judgment that the odds of that happening were low. But um, I think you've made the right collective judgment, which by showing up suggests that this is a real problem for US foreign policy. It's a real issue for you guys to be interested in. Uh, my name is Daryl Press. I'm the coordinator of the War and Peace Studies Program, which is part of the John Sloan Dickey Center here at Dartmouth. And I'm also a professor in the government department. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome you to the second talk in a year-long series that we're hosting on the general problem of nuclear proliferation. Three weeks ago, we had a talk uh, by Jim Walsh on the question, why states appear to be interested in nuclear weapons? Historically, why have states pursued nuclear weapons, and when you look at current potential proliferants, what seems to be driving them? Tonight, we're very fortunate to have Professor Barry Posen of MIT <laughs> speak about one of the particular cases, a particular case of considerable concern to many in the United States, many in the US government, a uh, particular possible case of proliferation, namely the case of Iran. And the thing we asked Barry to talk about is pretty simple, what should be done? Um, I want to note quickly that in the spring term, we're going to have, I believe, two more events, certainly one and hopefully two. Um, the two topics I hope we cover in the spring term are, number one, the US nuclear arsenal. So while we sit here and talk about the problem of other people possibly maybe having nuclear weapons, it seems like we might want to spend one session thinking a little bit about the US nuclear arsenal and why we have it um, you know, 60 years after we created this, and given the fact that we have the strongest conventional military force in the world. So hopefully, we're going to have a talk on that. And then finally, we're going to have a talk to end the, the season um, on the future of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, the Non-Proliferation Treaty is currently up for renewal, and so we'll have a talk from somebody who's actually um, a per peripheral participant in that process, give us a sense of that. But let me now quickly um, introduce Barry Posen. Uh, Professor Posen is the Ford International Professor of Political Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he's also the director of the um, Security Studies Program at MIT. He's written two books and numerous articles, and he's held a variety of prestigious fellowships, uh, including at the Council on Foreign Relations, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Woodrow Wilson Center, the Smithsonian Institute, the German Marshall Fund, and now, of course, the Dickey Center. Um, but the real reason he's here today is more simple than that, which is he's widely recognized as one of the United States' sharpest analysts of US foreign and national security policy. So with that, please join me in welcoming Barry Posen. Thank you, Daryl. Um, I always wonder about the applause coming first. It seems a little odd. Uh, I don't know if I can really measure up here. Uh, I'm not going to use fancy graphics or anything like that. I'm kind of an old-fashioned. Um, but I will give you a little word outline of what it is I'm going to try and do here today. Uh, Daryl and I were joking around earlier. I asked him how long I should speak for. He said two, three hours. and. Uh, he didn't say only a joke until 40 minutes later when I had a two or three hour talk. So uh, relax, we'll serve coffee later. Um, so what I'm going to do here is basically uh, give you a little bit of background. Um, and I'm sure many of you are knowledgeable in this. So for those of you who know all this background, you can nod off and wake up when I get to the, the fun part. But I'll give you a little bit of background about sort of the issue and the problem um, with Iran. And then I'm going to lay out the three key policy alternatives that are in play. Uh, and those three, just to telegraph, are persist in the current, the current policy effort, which is to use some combination of, of uh, diplomatic persuasion and, and maybe economic um, pressure and a hint of military threat to try and move to a negotiated solution. Um, the second is the one that. Um, Daryl was alluding to earlier, the possibility of waging some sort of a military campaign against Iran, which of late I like to call those wars, because even if they're short, uh, that's uh, what they amount to, and they don't always turn out short. Uh, and then the final strategy that I'll discuss is uh, essentially learning to live with a nuclear-armed Iran. So essentially, it's some combination of, of containment and deterrence. Um, Caveat being, uh, we don't really know how ambitious Iran is, so we don't know how strong an effort at containment and deterrence we and others would, would have to wage. But 
on the presumption that they proceed on their current path towards uh, either um, near nuclear weapon status or actual possession of a nuclear weapon, uh, they're going to raise some concerns in the region um, and also raise some concerns for us. So uh, what's, the, what's going on here? Um, uh, we have potential nuclear proliferation to a problem country. Uh, we know that Iran cheated on the non-proliferation treaty verification regime at a minimum. And according to many intelligence agencies, including the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, Iran had a clandestine nuclear weapons program for many years. Uh, the last time the CIA assessed this in 2007, they suggested that they believed the can their, their project, their actual nuclear weapons project, had ended in 2003, more or less when it was um, discovered. Uh, but more recently, the IAEA is suggesting that maybe um, their efforts to get at a nuclear weapon, their clandestine efforts to get at a nuclear weapon, um, have persisted. Now, Iran is a signatory of the, of the NPT. It's an old treaty now. It serves some purposes in helping countries that don't want nuclear weapons guarantee others that they don't have them, and groups of countries in given regions to essentially be able to assure one another that they don't have clandestine nuclear weapons programs. And it protects um, trade and in innocent nuclear technology, which some countries still want, and which if you follow our own energy policy, we're beginning to think about getting back into after many years of not um, building new reactors. Now, the treaty has obligations, including safeguards agreements with the International Atomic Energy Agency, which verifies that countries are not um, diverting from a peaceful nuclear program to a weapons program. Now, Iran violated these obligations and essentially cheated um, the IAEA uh, and worked around the IAEA to try and get certain capabilities, particularly the capability to enrich um, uranium. Uh, and the IAEA only found out about this by various um, intelligence, intelligence means, right? So this is cheating, right? So in the open source, the, in, the, in the nominally legitimate um, project that they had, uh, they cheated on their safeguards agreement, which raises one set of questions. And we believe that in a clandestine way, they also had a, a true weapons program. And there's questions that will remain about whether or not the progress achieved in the nominal energy program right, can transfer to a nuclear weapons program because the same enrichment technologies that you would use to make nuclear fuel are technologies you could use to make um, nuclear weapons. Um, this pattern of Iranian deception continues. Uh, for the last several years, there was construction of an underground enrichment facility um, at a place called Qum. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, they did not inform the Atom International Atomic Energy Agency they were doing that construction. And again, intelligence means discovered it, and that was revealed um, just this past fall. Um, now, had the Iranians informed the IAEA of the things they wanted to do, they would have been in compliance. But they didn't. So there's a you know, guilty flea where no man pursueth kind of aspect of this, right? Why are you hiding things that you, um, that you could have done in the open, or at least tried to do in the open? Now, Iran's actions, holding aside the question of Iran as a near nuclear weapon state being a, a certain kind of security threat, there's another issue here, which I just touched on briefly, and that is um, Iran's actions were a threat to the non-proliferation treaty itself which is, a, as I said, a global nuclear arms control regime that has some utility. Um, cheating brings the regime into disrepute. Um, and developing nuclear weapons in the Persian Gulf area is bound to make other countries concerned and may encourage them to get nuclear weapons, which means you can get yourself into a situation where the proliferation dominoes might fall. And I don't want to be too alarmist about this. My friend and colleague Jim Walsh was here just recently. And as he points out, these proliferation chains tend to be slower than the alarmists often suggest. But nevertheless, there is some reason um, uh, to be concerned. Now, there's also some specific reasons that some are concerned about Iran. And you will hear these as you, you know, read press accounts or editorials or listen to governments. And then there's just some concern that Iran could be unusually risk accepting when it comes to nuclear weapons. Now, I don't really know how to judge this, but the argument has spread that the regime is, um, uh, is, uh, is connected to a particular sect of uh, Shia Islam. Uh, and this sect believes that magical things will happen towards the end of um, 
history, and there's some concern that these guys might be willing to use nuclear weapons to hasten um, this religious event. Now, I have no way of judging this. I'm not a theologist, and I don't want to get into it. But I, all I'm doing here is informing you that this argument about the Iranians and Iranians with nuclear weapons often becomes much more than a political argument and much more than a technical argument. And you should just be aware of that. You have to basically make, make your uh, own your own judgments. Now, I think this, this argument is conjectural. I don't think the evidence is very strong that it can matter to their possession of nuclear weapons. I think the entire Iranian regime has proven itself to be actually surprisingly prudent compared to their rhetoric. But nevertheless, there are people who make these arguments. The more important, I think, question here is that um, uh, Iran is an important and capable state and a problem region. This is a region where the US acts and speaks as if it had important security interests and where Iran seems to pose a special kind of geopolitical problem for those interests. So just briefly, what are US interests? And here I'm going to skate very quickly over them. There's a lot of interests that center on the fact that in the Persian Gulf is full of oil and gas resources. But this is just a fact. And when I say that, it's not to say that we're there to steal them or take them or make money off them or whatever. But these assets <coughs> seem to matter somewhat to the stability of the global economy. And some people believe that America's presence there and um, as kind of the, the peacemaker or the hegemon, depending on your position, gives us some leverage over others. And if some other state were a hegemon there, it would give them leverage over others. So there's a general economic well-being aspect of this, and there may be a geostrategic leverage aspect of this. It's important to note that most of these resources are concentrated in states that are small and comparatively weak, and they're vulnerable to conquest um, and perhaps subversion. Um, and you can see the pattern of American interest. I mean, if you look at things that have happened since the fall of the Shah in 1979 and since the end of the Cold War, you know, American troops, if you look at where they are, we've sort of been leaving the Pacific and Europe where they were during the Cold War and flowing into the Persian Gulf, right? And you can just sort of see the curves crossing. The United States now has hundreds of thousands of troops in the Persian Gulf. It's fought several wars there um, since the, the Cold War um, uh, ended. Uh, so it's clear that we think um, we have a big interest there. The United States also has a, whatever term you want to call it, an alliance or a special relationship with the state of Israel. Uh, uh, and um, we have a problem with terror. And we ended up, as a consequence of the 9-11 attacks and some other ambitions, we ended up in a war in Iraq. And this region also has a connection to the Afghan war. And all I'm saying here is the United States has a lot of interest here, a lot of presence there. And this makes the Americans um, and others concerned about an Iran that might be um, more capable by virtue of having nuclear weapons. Now, just say a word about Iran. Iran's foreign policy is not easy to figure out. It's generally agreed that Iran has had a goal of expanding its influence in the Persian Gulf and in the greater Middle East. And they have some assets that might allow them to do that. Um, they are the principal local power in the Gulf population-wise and economy-wise, and maybe even militarily, aside from the United States, which is not you know, a Gulf state. Um, some say Iran's goals are mainly political. They're just interested in improving their influence. Others are concerned they may have bigger goals, right, to basically get real authority, get their fingers into the internal politics of other states, and in the worst case, maybe you know, expand physically, although I, I seldom see any evidence for this. Um, the Iranians tend to oppose U.S. policies generally, perhaps particularly in the region, uh, perhaps for totally understandable reasons. I'm sure Iran has every reason to view the United States as a potential threat. Um, uh, the Iranians have shown themselves willing and able to use violence uh, to achieve their goals, although, as I said earlier, I think they're a bit cagey about that. Um, they seem to have been active in Iraq, helping some of the insurgents fight the United States. Uh, they still seem to be active there, seeking a kind of sphere of influence. They seem to have supported terrorism against the United States in the region. Uh, because of their opposition to Israel, they have supported militant non-governmental organizations like Hezbollah and Hamas. Right? So um, they're busy. Uh, um, uh, and uh, they, they use violence um, to achieve their objectives. Uh, I don't see them doing things like risking war. Right? Um, they tend to pull back when it looks like whoever it is they're punching away at is going to get serious about using violence against them. But they do use violence. And um, as the Secretary of State pointed out, um, the Iranian 
um, Revolutionary Guard Corps, which was originally set up as sort of the internal political guardians of the revolution and then morphed into a more offensive military organization in the Iran-Iraq War, is a very big player in Iranian politics today. And it's not exactly clear what you compare them to. It's not exactly like the Communist Party. It's not exactly like a conventional military. It's not exactly like the sort of the KGB, right? You, know, you keep looking for examples in history to compare them to, and I can't quite find one. They're, they've got their, 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 their fingers reach deep into the society. They own a lot of businesses. They have an internal security apparatus. They have an external striking arm. They even have field units and, and naval units and air units. So it's a very interesting bunch. Uh, and um, uh, they seem to have a whole lot of authority in the state, and their state seems, to, and their authority seems to be growing. And it's difficult to tell, you know, whether this is going to make the state more risk accepting or less risk accepting. But it does give you pause because their stock and trade in the past has been this, right? Now, the issue the U.S. government faces is, is that Iran is on its way to solving the key problem for anyone who wants to make nuclear weapons, which is getting the fissionable material. Um, they're producing uranium hexafluoride. Um, and they're enriching it in centrifuges, um, and uh, their centrifuges appear to be working, although not well. Their hex seems to be useful, although it, some people say that it's, um, it's adulterated in some way, which then harms their enrichment activities. But nevertheless, they're getting enriched um, uranium, uh, and uh, it's not enriched to a very high level yet, but they're getting ready to try and they, they just produced a little more highly enriched uranium, and ultimately, if they wanted, they could probably get into the business of producing um, bomb-grade material. Right? Um, we don't know whether Iran has the intent to actually build a whole nuclear weapons complex. I think if they wanted to, if they're committed to it, they probably can. But they're solving technical problems bit by bit to get them closer and closer. So either they could be a nuclear weapon state, or they can be what some people call a near nuclear weapon state, a state that is very close to having the capability if it wants to have the capability. Either way, um, because of um, their bumptious um, diplomacy and activity and our expressed interests uh, in the Persian Gulf, um, the fact of a near nuclear or nuclear Iran creates some problems for the United States. Some people think those problems are extremely grave. And other people like me take a somewhat more relaxed attitude, right? Um, nevertheless, it's serious business, right? Every time you talk about nuclear weapons, it's serious business. So I'm to the key policy alternatives now, and I'm, I'm taking more time than I had hoped. Uh, so uh, we can negotiate, we can fight, we can contain and deter. Um, now. On, the on any of these issues, just before I, I, I proceed, I, I just want to have a little footnote here. Um, most of the discussion about policy is about dealing with the, the, the nuclear programs of the present Iranian regime. <laughs> Nevertheless, you should understand that there's another approach to this that was bandied about in the last administration and is still being bandied about <laughs> by people usually associated with the Republican Party. Uh, often so-called neoconservatives, right? And this is a regime change, right? In other words, let's not worry about the weapons per se. Let's take this regime, which appears to have interests antithetical to our own, prone to violence, et cetera, et cetera, just knock it over some way, subvert it, um, help the political opposition that's emerged in the country, something like that. There are people who think that this is a good idea. Now, I, 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 I don't think it's a particularly good idea because I don't think it's very easy for us to overthrow this regime. I just don't think it's likely to lead to success. And in the course of doing it, the other issue may be left under attended to, right? But you should understand that that argument is out there and I'm not going to treat it. So three options, first negotiation. And we've been trying to do this for several years. Uh, more or less under the auspices of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the United Nations Security Council, and the European Union. And we demanded in the first instance that Iran cease all its enrichment activities. And when we first made these demands, the Iranians actually briefly stopped enrichment. They stopped for about a year and then started up again. Um, 
We've demanded they open up entirely um, their entire complex to inspections by the International Atomic Energy Agency. The IEA has a long list of issues with the Iranians. They say, look, we need you to clarify all these issues. And the Iranians are cagey. They'll clarify one and then murkify another and withhold. And they go back and forth with us. And then they'll do something in secret. and We'll find out something new. So somehow, even though I think the IEA people would say they've made some progress, the progress that's been made in verifying what they have done and have not done is still not very good, right? So we still don't fully understand what it was they were doing in the past and even have good confidence about what it is um, they're doing now. Now, to get the Iranians to essentially come into full compliance with the IEA, essentially open their doors, open their books, et cetera, et cetera, we've been using a mixture of um, carrots and sticks. And the carrots and sticks are often the obverse of each other. The Americans and their friends have been adding sanctions to Iran, um, slowly, 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 trying to do things to make their lives complicated. And there's been some success here, although not nearly enough. And there's still many other economic levers or buttons that you could punch or pull to try and make Iran's life um, harder. And then the, the obverse is to say, look, uh, if you come clean, sanctions can go away. If you come, come clean, uh, it'll be a lot easier for you to develop your energy industry. It'll be a lot easier for you to improve the prosperity of your people. And somewhere in there, uh, some people on our side are willing to say, oh, by the way, you know, we'll, maybe we'll stop talking about regime change. Right? So there's been some mix of carrots and sticks offered. Um, and so far, not that much success. Right? Uh, some, it's not a zero thing. I mean, the Iranians are, I, I, as I said, quite shrewd at this game. Um, so the problems that have arisen from this negotiation process is that it's time consuming and Iran continues to progress on the path that it's on uh, while the negotiations proceed. Um, at some point, we may have to offer, we, not just us, but the, um, the other NPT signatories, will have to offer Iran some kind of a compromise that says, look, um, uh, you cheated to get your enrichment capability, but there's nothing in the NPT that prohibits enrichment capabilities per se, which happens to be true. And if you guys can come back into compliance with the regime and accept very intrusive kinds of inspections and verification, maybe we can tolerate some enrichment capability. We're, we're not there yet, by the way. My, Jim Walsh was here before as a proposal to that effect that he's been bandying about, and others have offered such a proposal. But the US government has not offered such a proposal. But this may be, if there is going to be a negotiated settlement, this may be where we end up, which means that Iran is still going to be closer to a nuclear weapons capability than some um, would like. Um, and if Iran, if in the end, to get a negotiated deal, we have to make that kind of compromise, I think we have to accept that some others in the region may also want a similar kind of compromise and may want to develop their own nuclear power industries as a, a way to get themselves into a near um, uh, nuclear um, capability, right? Um, and you know, some countries in the region already nuclear you know, nuclear capable countries. Israel is not a nuclear weapon state under the treaty. Under the treaty, there's only five nuclear weapon states, but there are states outside the treaty who are, like Israel, which is not a member of the treaty, which have nuclear weapons. And we have every reason to believe Israel has nuclear weapons, right? It's not a signatory of the NPT, has nuclear weapons. India, not a signatory, has nuclear weapons. Pakistan, not a signatory, has nuclear weapons, right? Um, so there's not much risk of proliferation to Israel that already happened. Right? So that's not the issue. But some of the other countries that people worry about deciding to get nuclear or near nuclear capabilities in response are Egypt, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia. Right? And we could talk later about what the odds are of, 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 of that happening. OK, so negotiation, sanctions, compromise, this is the path that we've been on. Uh, it's not producing much by way of reaction. The president is, is basically um, uh, on, on the road to trying to um, uh, make another move in the UN Security Council for more serious sanctions. Uh, the usual long pole in the tent here is China and Russia. They don't always support this kind of thing. China particularly is pr proving itself not to be particularly supportive. But nevertheless, what, what's in play now is to try and get stricter sanctions. And you should understand that um, uh, individual countries can put more, stronger sanctions on Iran than the UN agrees to. So the game diplomatically seems to be get some kind of intensified sanctions th through the UN Security Council, even if they're relatively weak, 
as a vehicle to legitimate the idea of sanctions, then there'd be stronger sanctions on the part of the United States, stronger sanctions on the part of the European Union, maybe stronger sanctions on the part of others, right? Um, some people like to talk about a silver bullet in this game. Uh, it will surprise some of you, but not all of you, to know that though Iran is an oil producer, it is a gasoline importer, and part of the way they keep people happy in their society is giving them cheap gasoline. Uh, costs them a mint to do it. Uh, and so there is an argument out there that says if you could get most of the producers of, of gasoline in the world to agree not to export gasoline to Iran, it would really make the regime hurt. I don't know if this is true or not. Right? I think this regime has proven itself pretty resilient. I'm guessing we can't get everyone who has gasoline to cooperate in this. But this is the new magic bullet that people are talking about. Is we'll get really harsh sanctions. You know, this, this is, the, this is the, the hot thing now. We're trying to get really, really harsh sanctions uh, in the hopes that this will hurt the regime enough that they'll think better of this, this whole project. OK, so now I'll move to the two more dramatic um, ideas for dealing with this that are out there. Um, one is, as I said, military action. Uh, usually when people are talking about military action, they're talking about airstrikes of some kind. Uh, and uh, you know, airstrikes can, you know, an aerial campaign can be short or long, and many targets are few, ambitious goals, weak goals. Uh, I don't think anyone at this point is talking about airstrikes just for the sake of trying to coerce Iran. In other words, finding something to bomb in the hopes that the Iranians hurt enough to say, oh, now I get it. I better give up this system. I don't think that's what people are talking about when they talk about airstrikes. They're talking about using aerial attacks to try and degrade, <coughs> take away, eliminate Iran's capability to produce um, uh, uh, fissionable material or more. Right? So usually there's three different versions of the air campaign discussed, and I'll, I'll say something about um, each of them. One is a very focused campaign on the nuclear targets. Right? And sometimes this is you know, a campaign people talk about, not a campaign really being done by the United States, but maybe a campaign that even the Israelis could do. Right? And this focuses on, on two or three very high value targets. Um, the place where the Iranians make their uranium hexafluoride gas, which is, I guess, Isfahan. Uh, the place where they have the, the bulk of the centrifuges we know about, which is Natanz. Right? These are the two you know, big targets. That's Natanz is an interesting target because it's a great, the, the centrifuge raises are in great, big, very thick concrete bunkers buried under many layers of dirt. So it's an interesting technical problem. Forgive the, the flippancy, but it's an interesting technical problem to figure out you know, how you can attack this, this target. Um, uh, now, these are valuable targets. So small attacks, I think people agree, will set the program back. You know, this is often the euphemism that's used. No one knows how much. I haven't heard anyone say how much it's going to set the program back. You know, six months, a year, two years, five years, ten years, I have no idea, right? But it's a way to sort of, you know, Hit them, do some damage to the things that outsiders care about, right? And give, and then then the Iranians have a chance to consider whether they want to get back in the game or maybe give this up. Uh, there is a political problem with these attack, the uh, attack of this kind, and then in some sense it doesn't do enough damage, and it may redound to the advantage of the regime, right? The regime might like to get thwacked by the Israelis right now. It might like to get hit by the Americans right now, particularly if it were hit in a small way, because the regime is under domestic political pressure. This would change the debate inside Iran and change the debate in the region and wouldn't do much good. So in a weird way, you know, I, I, the Iranians might be leaning into an attack by the Israelis. There's actually some strange information that appeared in the press in the last few days that says uh, a lot of the Iranian uh, enriched, uh, the, the rich uranium uh, of Iran has been has been moved to an above ground facility near you know in Natanz, but it's in an above ground facility, and and you can just sort of see it. It's like saying, "Hit me, kick me, please, you know, destroy me." And um, the question is why? And the regime, for all we know, the regime has a kind of a strange um, uh, I, idea here. Um, the Americans like to threaten an Israeli attack. I mean, if you look at our diplomacy and you read the papers about it, you know, we're always saying to the Chinese, "You really got to help us with these sanctions. If you don't, those Israelis are going to attack." And I'm guessing the Chinese are scratching their heads. Wait a second, don't the Israelis work for you? I mean, aren't, don't, don't they have your weapons and aren't they your client? And are you really telling me you can't stop them from doing this if you want to? I'm just guessing that it goes back and forth like this. But 
whether you know whether the Chinese have these questions or not, we like to sort of intimate that you know you know there's a threat that leaves something to chance here. We Americans might not want to have this war right now, but these Israelis they're really mad, really concerned about this, right? And you can imagine why they would be. I mean, the the regime says some very um, colorful things about Israel and hateful things about Israel, uh, and um, uh, it makes the Israelis nervous to think that um, Iran could have uh, nuclear weapons. Um, so that's attack number one, uh, and I think I personally think the Israelis could probably do that attack, that very limited attack. Uh, it's a long way, but I, I think they can probably do it. Uh, and um, uh, I don't think it really solves any problems, uh, and may make the problem a little bit worse. Right? Personal view. Um, oh, by the way. Uh, uh, leaving it to Israel doesn't let the Americans off the hook politically. Uh, I mean, the locals, the Iranians are going to blame the Americans all the same for this attack, right? So it's not like um, the Americans are going to escape culpability and the Iranians aren't going to be mad at us. They're still going to be mad at us if the Israelis do it. So it's not, it's not a way to kind of you know, do this you know, indirectly and sort of escape um, responsibility. The second kind of attack is a kind of a bigger one, which would fo still focus on the, on the nuclear program, but in a broader sense. Uh, we don't know how much intelligence the United States government has collected about the Iranian nuclear program, but aside from these two sites, there's lots of other sites, uh, almost assuredly. For example, the site we just discovered, right, and that we, you know, that we um, decided to make an issue of, we've been watching that site for two or three years, right? And I'm sure since we've been focusing on the Iranians for many years, we have lots of targets, right? Now, whether the targets are good, verified, confirmed, high value, who knows, right? But there's lots of targets, I'm sure. Right, I have no doubt um, about that, not because I have clearances or anything. I don't. I just know the way these guys operate. Uh, and I've seen estimates of many as sort of 400 aim points in such an attack. Right? Those are sort of places where you want to put a weapon, a precision guided weapon. So this is a pretty big attack um, uh, and would require some ancillary attacks to you know, take down Iranian surface down missile systems and things like that. So it's a, it's a big deal. And again, the usual language you hear is that this would set the Iranians back, right? Presumably back farther than the narrow Israeli attack would. But how much, again, you don't really know. And occasionally, even people in the American intelligence business will say, you know, we really can't prevent them from becoming a nuclear weapon state if they want to. We can make it painful. We can make it costly. We can make it time consuming. But we can't do enough damage to prevent it. Right. Even the director of national intelligence made this point the other day. Denny Blair made it, I think, in some congressional testimony. You know, if they're really committed to this, military action is not going to stop it. You remember, a lot of this is in people's heads. You know, they know how to make centrifuges. They know how to design bombs, or they don't. They know how to work the metal. They know. They know. It's in people's heads, right? And if you can't get the heads, and no one's talking about doing that or how you would do that, um, the basic knowledge is there, right? Um, which takes us to the larger attack, you know, small, medium, large. Uh, and this, is, this attack would really be designed to um, deal with the possibility of Iranian retaliation. Because if you do a, attacks of some size, it's very possible the Iranians are going to try and punch back at you. And if you think that they're going to punch back at you, then maybe you want to forestall that. So there's a, propen there's, a, there's a propensity in sort of planning these operations for the target sets to grow and for the ambitions, the military ambitions to become larger as people begin asking themselves the question, well, if we do this, what can they do? Right? In a second, I'll talk about some of the things that people are worried about the Iranians being able to do, which then have the effect of driving the target set higher and driving the initial operations um, to be bigger. So in this operation, you'd be trying to get their Anything you knew about that was connected to the nuclear weapons proper, you'd probably, while you're at it, you might as well go after the entire defense industry, particularly anything that has to do with rockets or missiles, right? Because that would be the delivery system. Um, because you're worried about retaliation, you might as well go after their air force and go after their, all the rest of their surface air missile systems. And uh, gee, it's the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps that's a pain in the neck. Gee, if we know where they like to camp or sleep, let's hit those places too. Uh, and if they own any rockets or naval vessels or anything else, shoot, destroy those too, because that's what they're going to retaliate with, right? Um, and here, I don't know how big the target is. I haven't tried to generate my own target set. This is something that you know, sort of vary occasionally in my past I've tried to do. But if you look at sort of the, 
what we do know about the first nights of the 1991 Gulf War, the, the, the size, the number of targets they tried to hit in the first two or three days of the 1991 Gulf War, it was in the thousands in the first two or three nights of the war. So I think you can imagine that th this, this would be in the thousands, right? Um, now, what are Iran's retaliatory options that we're presumably trying to um, forestall? Um, well, uh, in varying degrees of plausibility. One, um, American forces are still across the border in Iraq, and American forces are across the Iranian border in Afghanistan, right? And the Iranians have dabbled in Iraqi politics before. They have their cat's paws there. Um, they have their own special operators who understand the area very well. They have their own prepositioned equipment and military materiel, probably inside Iraq that we haven't found yet. And they can make a lot of trouble. Right. How much? We don't know, but even with very limited military assets in the past, they were able to make a good bit of trouble. So that's one thing, and that goes, cuts directly at American military forces. Um, second, you know, there's an array of oil installations on the Arab side of the Gulf that the Iranians can target. Um, their weapons for doing this are not really very good. Um, they can reach these targets in many cases, but whether they can hit anything that's truly vital is unclear. Right? Um, and some students of mine have tried to do this analysis, and it's very hard to make the argument the Iranians could do really significant damage to the oil infrastructure on the other side of the Gulf. It's just, just hard to see how they could do it. They, don't, they just don't have the capability yet. But nevertheless, if rockets are flying and things are blowing up, you can be reasonably sure that energy markets are going to be sensitive to that, and you're going to see some um, price spikes. Same is true for, oil supply, for energy supply routes, right? Most of the oil that leaves the Persian Gulf leaves by sea, goes through some choke points, the Strait of Hormuz, the Iranians have some naval capability, have some mines, have some land-based anti-ship missile, have some experience with small boat operations in that part of the world. Um, there's lots of different things they could do to harass the, um, the, the, the flow of oil. Some people say, ooh, they're going to close the Persian Gulf. That doesn't look that doable for them either. They're just not quite capable enough. What, could, what they can do is harass. They can make trouble. Right? And they could probably harass and make trouble for quite a long time. Um, if their basic capabilities are not degraded from the get-go, which I think is, you know, what we're going to be um, tempted um, to do. Um, there's other things that, um, uh, uh, that probably are, you know, are cause for concern, but whether or not the Iranians could really push those buttons are unclear. There are a lot of Shia Arab populations in the, in the, in the Arab oil states. And, um, some people, including particularly Arab governments, have been concerned that these could be vehicles for subversion in those states. And for example, the Shia population in the Saudi oil producing a areas is actually quite high. Right? So there's a risk of, that the, the Iranians could attempt subversion. Right? Um, so large air attacks could limit the Iranian possibilities in these areas. Their possibilities are not really that great to start with. Um, but you can't eliminate everything. Right? In other words, there's not much you can do about the ability of the Iranians I suspect, to get at American forces in Iraq and to get at American forces in Afghanistan. I think that's something you just have to fight them out on the, on, on the, um, uh, on the ground. Um, you should also probably take into account that uh, even if the Iranians can't do that much damage to oil or oil flows, their own oil will probably be off the market for the duration. That's about two and a half million barrels a day. And uh, the, one, the one place where there's some oil that is vulnerable to Iranian weapons is probably southern Iraq. So Iraqi oil might go off the market. You might lose another million barrels a day. This is not a gigantic amount, but it's not trivial either. You know, three million barrels a day goes off. Um, uh, th there's going to be some trouble. Um, footnote, which Daryl can tell you about. Uh, we stock a lot of oil against eventualities like this, as do other countries. Right? So there's uh, well over one and a half uh, billion barrels of oil in reserve. Um, so we can ride this out for a long time if we have to, right? We in the world, right? We have about 750 million barrels. I think the Europeans have the same. The Chinese have a little. The Japanese have some. And those are government stocks, and there's more in commercial stocks. So uh, when you say oil is going to go off the market, oil markets are going to be royal, there's ways that governments can fight this, right? Um, and by saying all this, I'm not trying to sort of make light of it, but I think we have to be realistic. I used to like to take, I, I used to, when I used to give this talk, I used to take the Iranian retaliation very seriously, because um, I used to think that they could make a lot of trouble. But I'm more and more skeptical of how much trouble they can make, except 
when I think about what they could conceivably do on the ground um, uh, uh, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so, uh, oh, just as an aside here, uh, the Iranians could be cagey. They could just wait. They might not do anything, right? Um, you know, if you if you if you read, if you go to, if you watch the Godfather movies as many times as I have, you learn that revenge is a dish that's best eaten cold. And uh, um, it's very possible that these guys will scratch their heads and say, "Now's not the time." They are pretty cagey, and we'll get our own back at another time, right? And uh, um, uh, so they may not um, collaborate. Uh, now, so military option, yeah, probably does some good. Uh, can the Iranians really get you back very aggressively? Nah, probably not as much as you might think. Uh, is this the only thing we have to think about? No. Uh, we also have to intrude some politics into this conversation and ask about the political fallout from this war. And this is, you know, you often end up in problems in talking about issues of this kind because it's, it's much somehow easier to talk to people about substantive and material things that happen than it is to talk about political things that happen. But there's a few questions to ask here. One, if the Iranians do decide they want to brawl, how does the war end, right? You can start a war with air power, but you can't necessarily finish it, right? So how does the war end, right? What makes the Iranians finally decide to say uncle? So that's question one. Right? Um, and I'm sure that guys who are in the ground forces, the U.S. ground forces in the Army, are going to whisper in the ear of, their, of, of, of the President as well as their Air, air and Navy brethren, guys, if, if they, these guys don't say, Uncle, do you really think that um, we can go solve this problem for you? All our troops are in Afghanistan and Iraq, right? And uh, we can't sort of put together an invasion force to go force the Iranians to quit if that's what this takes. Right? So that's, that's a question. Um, second, uh, even if you know, oil exports continue and oil prices only rise a little bit, uh, not too many people are killed, et cetera, et cetera, it's not clear that everyone in the world is going to thank us for you know, creating all this excitement. Maybe they will, I don't know, but I, they usually don't like this much excitement. Uh, and the same is true for people in the region. I mean, the Arab governments in the region are all of two minds on this. One, they're very afraid of Iran. They don't want Iran to be a nuclear weapon state. Um, at the same time, uh, it's not clear that they want a war either, because at various times, their own populations have been sympathetic to the Iranians, right? And it's not clear that they want another bit of political theater that's going to make their population sympathetic to the Iranians, right? So, it's not clear to me that you can really count on your allies. Your allies will, on one day, tell you they want you to stand firm, and then when the fallout comes from standing firm, they may not all be there for you. Right? Um, uh, and finally, you know, the United States is already pretty deep into Iran's, uh, you know, historical narrative. You know, they sort of think that their their modern life has been messed up because of American machinations, and you know, the Americans have machinated there at various times. So you're even deeper in that narrative. Um, and, you know, okay, so what does that mean? Who knows, right? Um, but it's another generation of Iranian young people growing up with the idea that America is the biggest obstacle to their success as a nation. It, just by the way, as an aside here, this nuclear, you know, Jim spoke about uh, why states want nuclear weapons. We don't, or nuclear technology, we don't know that the Iranians want nuclear technology or nuclear weapons because they want to fight with us or they have any ambitions at all. This could be a prestige project for them. Or it could be a combination of motives, right? Uh, one thing that's interesting is that uh, there is some evidence that even in the Iranian opposition, these nuclear energy programs are popular. And even in the Iranian diaspora, there's a certain amount of pride that the Iranian scientific and technical elite has figured out you know, basically how to get into the nuclear energy game, right? So again, sort of push it, punching this button, however defensive we or our coalition partners in the region, out of the region, think it is, it's not clear that punching this button is necessarily going to be perceived across the spectrum in Iran as something that somehow their regime had coming and that it wasn't a, you know, an off offense to them. It may still be perceived as an offense to the people of Iran. We, you just don't know how it's, going to, how it's going to play politically. Maybe there's somebody who studies Iran internally who thinks they know, could say something about it. I, I'm guessing it's a fraught 
activity, you know, a two-edged sword. So there's lots of potential political trouble here, right? Hard to put a dollar value on it or a casualty number on it or anything else, but has to be thought about, has to be cranked into this. Now, I, I, just to reveal my true nature, and I've, you know, if you Google me up, you'll find that I, I favor this third policy, which I'm going to try and talk about now, even though I should be winding up. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl's giving me the look. Uh, so containment and deterrence, and I'll skate through this very briefly so we can get to questions. Um, okay, so throughout the Cold War, the United States, you know, was concerned that the Soviet Union might have ambitions uh, on its periphery, particularly in Europe. Uh, they were a big state, lots of nuclear weapons, lots of military force, had to live with them. Uh, they were there, we were here. Uh, we organized a coalition to contain and deter them. It was a pretty good policy, and we sat around and we waited, and that mighty country overexerted itself competing with us and um, uh, delegitimated itself to its people and gradually fell apart. Its elite came to a point where it would neither kill nor die for the ideas that they had started their country on. It's a crashing success, right? Um, so here's Iran. It's not really a very powerful country. Uh, it hasn't got an exportable ideology. Uh, it's got a lot of problems in its region. Uh, what would be wrong with containment and deterrence of Iran, right? Um, Iran has several weaknesses in whatever project it has in the region. Um, it is regionally the strongest power, and it's there, and we're mainly here. So typically, states worry about the strong power that's near them, and Iran is the strong power that's near these other powers in the Gulf. So it's probably true that Iran makes them afraid. It makes them want to band together to ensure themselves against the possibility that the Iranians could prove aggressive, right? Um, second, Iran is a Persian country. That's their ethno-cultural background. And most of the other countries there are Arabs. And Arabs and Persians are not fast friends. Um, uh, they've been rivals for a long time, right? Uh, and third, Iran is largely a Shiite country in terms of sects of, of Islam. And the Arabs are mainly, not entirely, but mainly Sunni, right? Um, thus, given an Iranian foreign policy posture that I think is fair, fair, fair to say is at least bumptious, um, Iran's relative power advantage, and these identity markers, Iran is destined to produce suspicion, if not outright hostility, among its neighbors. And um, well-worn international relations theories, such as balance of power theory or its younger cousin balance of threat theory, suggest that the locals are going to want to pull together to balance Iranian power. So the Americans don't have to offer much to produce a coalition um, to contain and deter the Iranians. Now, by the way, um, in the Arab world, balancing behavior is actually quite common. Steve Walt, the um, inventor of balance of threat theory. His book, Origin of Alliances, where he advances theory, is really about the Arab world. And there's lots of balancing behavior in the Arab world. And many of the local governments in the Arab world have participated in balancing behavior, particularly the Saudis, right? And it's already starting. I mean, this, you know, in the last week or two, it leaked out, although it's been common knowledge for longer. At least four Gulf states have asked the Americans to deploy anti-tactical ballistic missiles, Patriot anti-tactical ballistic missiles, to their countries. And they're there now. Right? Um, so, and the Iranians are already complaining about it. And, you know, all we're saying is, look, you've got nobody to blame but yourselves. Right? If you're going to do what you're going to do and act the way you're going to act, you're going to make others around you scared. And they're going to look for a big friend, and that's us. Right? Um, now, to do containment and deterrence right in this part of the world, you want to be careful not to simply ape what you did in the Cold War. This is a different part of the world. Uh, First of all, Iran is a much weaker enemy than the Russians. Um, I have some figure here that I like to throw around. U.S. defense spending is three times Iran's GDP. <laughs> U.S. defense spending is 100 times that of Iran, right? Um, uh, our GDP was about twice the Soviet, right? So this is a very weak country compared to the United States. So we don't have to be so much in their face. Um, second, nationalism is a very powerful force in the Arab world, so you don't want this to be too intrusive. You don't want a lot of Americans crawling all over the country. You don't want it to seem like only an American thing, right? You'd like the, the rest of the big oil and energy consumers to, be a, to play a part in this. You'd like to do as much as you can from standing off, for being at sea, and 
Um, if you're concerned that you might need ground power there quickly, you can pre-position material on ships and what like. We did this once before. We did it before 1991. It worked fine against Saddam Hussein, who was actually more of a coiled spring than the Iranians. You don't want any nuclear weapons ashore. And when we make deterrent threats, you know, we should make them. I know this sounds silly, but we should make them in a nice way, right? Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, the Iranians, if the Iranians are contemplating becoming a nuclear weapon state or a near nuclear weapon state, then they need to be socialized about what that means, right? And what that means is to be a nuclear weapon state is to be a nuclear target. And to, to be a nuclear target of the United States is to be inviting real hell to rain down on you. In fact, to be a nuclear target of the Israelis is to be inviting real nuclear hell to rain down on you. And the point here is not to say, you know, we're going to get you. The point is, is that, gee, you guys are entering a really tough game here. And um, if mistakes get made, if bad things happen, if you're too adventurous, the war escalates, humongous tragedies are going to happen, right? And we don't want them to happen, right? But you're, you're, you're entering the big leagues. And if you want to be in the big leagues, you have to understand the rights and responsibilities thereof. And they're not pretty, right? It's not pretty, right? So that's the way to make threats, not pound the table, but just say, you know, welcome to the tragedy of modern international politics. Now, there's a lot of counterarguments that are often advanced against this, and I don't want to go through them all right now. I can go through them all, but I think you'll think of some of them. So I think rather than go through all those, I think I should just stop and just remind you I went through these three options, tried to lay out the strengths and weaknesses of each of these options. It's clear that I have sort of a bias here towards containment and deterrence. I would like diplomacy and economic sanctions to work. I'm skeptical that they will, right? And I think we're going to be driven in one of these other two directions. And just as a, you know, just a tell you a little story here. Uh, when I first began advancing this idea that containment and deterrence was a viable strategy, which I did several years ago in a New York Times article, uh, I received lots of messages um, that I was a nut, right? That this was a terrible idea and enormously fraught policy. Uh, no right thinking person could ever do it, would ever believe in it. I mean, it's just very, very critical kinds of things um, from people in the region, from people in the policy world. And you'll still hear People, some people who have been involved in policy debates say this is, you know, can't, can't be done, containment deterrence, can't live with it. Basically, these Iranians are crazy. This, they have to, this, this capability has to be rubbed out, right? But it has, the, the tenor of the debate has changed. So the idea that containment and deterrent is a viable option is much more widely accepted than it was um, uh, when I first advanced the idea. And I think it's because these are all difficult. None of these are happy outcomes, right? They're all difficult. So, you know, to govern is to choose, as someone once said, and you're choosing from, you know, three difficult alternatives. And I think in the end, this is the, the easiest one to implement, but uh, none of them are pretty. So with that, I think we should turn to questions. Do you want to pick people or? Okay, so uh, I'm going to use the point and shoot, and I will try and be democratic in a spatial way. So I'll go from left to right to left to right. No comment on your politics intended. You were quick off the mark. I think the contain, uh, uh, containment strategy is not only correct because we had some experience with uh, the Soviet Union and the Iranians are going to have that experience with Israel. We are much better off viewing, we're, we're much better off viewing, oddly enough, Iranian power as a stable, a potentially stabilizing force and Iran as a potential silent ally. One reason for that is that Ahmadinejad and the jihadists are much weaker in Iran than some people pretend. There's a very large civil society which is not extremist. This is a Farsi society. They don't like the Arabs. And if uh, we are qu quite clear to them that we see common interests once they become a nuclear power that don't scare us, and that can stabilize the world, I think one of the things that people want with nuclear power is the symbol of respect and status. And that society, with its Persian imperial history, uh, we ought to take that seriously and work with them, not against them. So I'll, I'll take that as a statement, so I won't uh, actually respond. That way we can get more people in the game. So this gentleman, Dartmouth 12. <laughs> um, by, by allowing Iran to have nuclear weapons as sort of a 
a symbol of our know, respect for them. What does that say for other countries that may be looking for respect, sort of emerging powers like Venezuela, Brazil, uh, countries that may be, you know, looking for respect? Should we encourage or, you know, allow nuclear programs in those countries as well? Well, I, I, I think that's a... I think that's a good question, and I think it's a viable problem in, in the NPT, right? And uh, this, this is why, I mean, I, I think in the end, the way to thread the needle between what this gentleman was saying and what you were saying is to re return to, to basically to argue law. And this is coming from a person who basically isn't, you know, I'm basically a realist, and I'm not that keen on treaties and whatnot, right? We did build a regime here to try and regulate um, uh, nuclear energy uh, and trade in nuclear energy and try and keep it from crossing into the um, weapons world. The Iranians signed that treaty by choice and stayed in the treaty and then cheated on the treaty. I, I think the, the way to thread this needle is to give the Iranians a path back to being right with the treaty, right? So discourage weapons, right? And, and basically say, look, that in fact is a violation of the treaty, and uh, there's no way to make violating the treaty um, a prestigious and good thing, right? What we should do is say, look, um, uh, you know, f forgiveness is always possible, um, and um, there's a path back to rightness with the treaty and rightness with the IAA, which is what we've done, right? But it means that at some point in the path of that rightness, the Americans and not just the Americans, the Europeans, and the French have been very hard over on this as well. Um, we're going to have to decide whether or not um, Iran can have what people call a full fuel cycle. In other words, in, in the nuclear energy business, whether they're going to have the right, the right to at least, in theory, manufacture their own fuel. Now, our, our position and the French position and everyone else's position has been no enrichment period. In other words, you've lost your right to a full fuel cycle when you cheated, right? And my guess is that if we want a negotiated solution, um, in the end, we're going to have to agree that they have a right to a full fuel cycle. They're going to have to agree to intrusive verification. And by the way, you know, the IEA does intrusive verification in lots of places. Um, many countries have signed up to a new level of verification, the so-called additional protocols in the IEA. So it's not like there's anything particularly discriminatory here, right? There's discrimination between in the treaty between the original nuclear weapon states in the treaty and everyone else who's a non-nuclear weapon state in the treaty. And then the countries that stayed out, the renegades, right, who basically said, I need nuclear weapons. I'm not going to be part of your treaty. I don't need your help. I don't need your trade and technology. I got my own problems, right? That's a different part of the world. And Iran can decide to live outside the treaty or they can decide to live inside the treaty, right? And I think from a from the point of view of diplomacy negotiation, we should be finding a path for them to live inside the treaty. That's what Jim, was Jim has been arguing for. And I think it's our best chance. Uh, and um, uh, I, I think it's, the, I think it's a, a reasonable place for the Iranians to go. It's not going to make everyone happy, by the way. right? Um, but I think it helps deal a little bit with the problem that you're talking about, which is suddenly you know, nuclear weapons, which were a big problem, right? once you have them uh, and in getting them, will be not only sort of a, you know, a, something you get because you think you have really serious security problems and you have no choice, but it'll just be kind of a, you know, a thing to have because it's cool. I, I think making it uncool, <laughs> to coin a phrase, uh, is probably a good idea, right? And I think we have a way to do that, right? So that, I think that's the only way to thread the needle. may not work. Oh, standard. We've got standing room only people. I see. Thank you. How would an attack in Iran or the development of a nuclear weapons program affect the actions of Hamas or Hezbollah or the other terrorist groups that Iran sponsors? You're asking how would the attack affect them? How would either scenario work out? Okay, so, okay, so there, there's an argument, well, there's several, several arguments here. One is um, uh, we or the Israelis attack Iran and Iran has these cat's paws that it can use, Hezbollah or Hamas. Right, that's one argument that's out there. And I think that argument was sort of plausible you know, 18 months or two years ago, right? Um, uh, but I, I think the Hezbollah and Hamas are not eager for a fight right now. Neither of them is eager for a fight. Even though Hezbollah has a whole story of its war with the Israelis that makes it out to be a heroic victory, um, everyone else in Lebanon knows that it wasn't so great. And uh, um, I think Hezbollah understands that um, uh, it, it's not necessarily an unalloyed benefit for them to do this again, right? I think Hezbollah is out for Hezbollah. I don't think 
they work for Iran. I think they have an alliance of convenience. The same is true of Hamas. Hamas just got badly savaged in cast lead. Um, and I don't think they're eager for a fight. In fact, many people have commented since cast lead, the border between Gaza and Israel has been really quiet, right? I mean, you know, it's, you know people hate, you know, you hate to say it, right? But um, deterrence sometimes deters, right? The, th the credible threat to inflict punishment, uh, particularly when it's been demonstrated, sometimes deters. So I I'm not so worried about that. And in a way, you know, it it's a weird thing, right? Because in a way, I would like people to be a little more concerned about the risks and costs of attacking um, uh, Iran than, than, than maybe they are. Now, there is this other argument that's been advanced, um, and that is sort of uh, uh, if Iran is, were to become a nuclear weapon state, it might begin to perceive itself to be sort of invulnerable to retaliation from others, and it would become more bold, more adventurous in the use of force abroad, right? Uh, subversion and other things. And uh, it's not exactly clear to me that that's um, true. Uh, and even if it's true, uh, I think we and others have demonstrated that um, uh, Iranians' cat's paws can be dealt with, right? And so uh, I think trying. I, I think this is not the best reason for trying you know, for being worried about an Iranian nuclear weapons capability. Is that the Iranians will somehow be emboldened to act more in terms of subversion and other kinds of things uh, against the Israelis? Now, it's, I don't live in Israel, so it's easy for me to say that. Right. Um, I wasn't. I, I was. I, I've been around that that area a fair amount, uh, but I've never been there for one of the wars. Right. And um, uh, when the rockets start flying, maybe you think about things in a different way. Right. So, uh, you know, there is that risk. But I think the the way to deal with that risk is through local deterrence. And then the second thing is, is that um, even if the Iranians have nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons will keep us from conquering Iran. I don't want to conquer Iran. I'm not sure even the most hawkish Americans want to conquer Iran. Right? They don't keep you from doing other things to the Iranians. And Iranian life can be immensely complicated without having to attack Iran proper, right? as it has been already and as it could be again. Right? So there are other ways, I think, to discourage the um, Iranians from, uh, from playing this game and others from playing with the Iranians. I'm going to go to the other side. Um, I know it makes whoever has the mic have to run, but oh, so so can you run over here? Oh, you have a mic. Oh, good. So why don't you take this this really tall guy who's behind you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you you alluded to Secretary Clinton's remarks about the Revolutionary Guard playing an increasing role in Iranian society. Yeah. So how would you uh, assess? introducing nuclear weapons when we have this changing domestic balance of power in Iran uh, combined with, you know, increasing domestic opposition? And how would that increase the riskiness of either unauthorized use or unauthorized transfer or loss of control in the event of a, you know, destabilizing event, you know, whether it be protests or, you know, a, s some other kind of domestic instability? Yeah. Well, it's a good question. We faced this once before when the, you know, the, you know in, in China, you know, back during the Tiananmen, we were worried that um, maybe the country would, would come apart and what would happen to their nuclear weapons. And we have the same problem with Pakistan. We're always worried about, about Pakistan. So it's not, you know, it's not a new problem. Uh, well, uh, here's what I would say. Um, uh, giving nuclear weapons away to other non-state actors, giving away to non-state actors. Um, there, I, I find this a, a, a not particularly likely scenario. And there are several reasons I think it's not very likely. One is um, uh, you give a nuclear weapon away to an, an uncontrolled non-state actor that's outside your country. You don't know where the weapon's going to end up, right? They may use it for what they say they're going to use it for. They're going to use it for, they use it for something else. Second, you can't be sure that you're not going to be implicated. In fact. If a nuclear weapon is used anywhere in the world surreptitiously, there's going to be a, you know, it's, it's not like it's a nuclear war. So after the fact, every, you know, all the countries in the world will be really worried about where this weapon came from and who did it. I mean, this is a small consolation to those who were you know, killed, right? But the rest of the world is going to be very, very concerned about this. And there's going to be a concerted effort to figure out where this thing came from. And wherever it came from is going to be on the business end of an enormous amount of international trouble, right? Ranging from actual nuclear retaliation Right to any of a number of other things. Right, so um, if you get into this game, you a you have a risk that it's not going to turn out the way you thought in terms of your 
arrangement with whoever you gave it to. And second of all, there's a very good risk that really bad things are going to happen to you. Right? Now, there is this other problem, which is the weapons could simply disappear. Right? In other words, if there's a true civil war in Iran, right, um, you know, somebody's going to try and make off with a weapon, and they're going to try and get something for it. But then the question is what? Right? Um, and that involves you in some kind of political um, game, uh, some sort of negotiation. Now, I should say that I tend to rate politics pretty highly here. So we have to understand that um, there is always the wild card risk. In other words, if indeed somewhere in the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps there are people who are not busy building factories and companies and collecting money and whatnot to feather their nests and live a good life and enjoy being the power elite, which is my first explanation of what they're doing, but instead are messianic people of some kind. They think that they're bringing you know, something closer, you know, the, 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 end, the end, end times, as they say in Christianity, closer, um, then you've got a wild card here. And, and normal deterrence, rationality kind of criteria don't apply. Right? And that's something that's it's just very hard to deal with. So you sort of have a problem of having to assess what are the risks of ever get, getting to that situation relative to the cost of trying to prevent it directly. Now, there's an intermediate world here, which is um, to sort of say, well, look, um, I'm watching your country and I'm watching your weapons, right? And if things go a certain way, that's when I, I might act, right? And that's well into the world that no one talks to me about, right? In other words, the, the world in the United States government where we try and figure out instrumentally what you would do to get your arms around, say, Pakistani nuclear weapons or what you would do instrumentally to get your arms around somebody else's nuclear weapons before they fell into the wrong hands, that's a very... Um, private world, very secret world, right? But the world exists, right? Um, and you know, er, you know, for every person in the country who's who's <coughs> motivated by non-rational kind of criteria, there are probably a lot of other people who are motivated by rational criteria. And you're going to reach out to those people at these moments. You know, you're going to say, look, you know, there's some things you have to watch out for here, right? So I think there are approaches, there are ways, but. The risk that you're talking about, I think it would be crazy for me to simply stand here and say, this risk does not exist. I think the risk does exist. Oh, now with somebody, we should get somebody in the middle. This, in, in the lime green. See, I have to think up these George Bushian names for people. <laughs> How can we simultaneously assume a con, um, containment and deterrence strategy and also continue to allow Iran to live, to quote unquote, live inside the NPT? How are those uh, compatible paths? Oh, allowing I, it to become a nuclear power and allowing it to live inside and receive the benefits of the NPT. Well, I, 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 what I'm saying is that there's, they have two ways to go, right? In other words, well, let's be honest here. I mean, in, an, in my analytic world, they have two ways to go. But the, world, the real world is actually likely to be murkier. So I'm guessing what the Iranians are going to do is not, not leave the NPT, not build a nuclear weapon, continue to make progress on enrichment, continue to play this on again, off again game with us, right, and with the rest of the world, so that, in fact, you're going to be going on two tracks simultaneously. One is to try and negotiate them back into conformity with the treaty, and the other is building a containment and deterrence regime, right, and basically saying to them, we can track you one way. In other words, the, the closer you come to having the capabilities we don't want you to have, the more ferocious our containment and deterrence regime is going to be, right? And do that as it progresses, but give them a way back, right? And I, I, I've tried, I've started, I haven't, this is an argument I haven't made in print, but I believe it to be the case that if you're an Iranian policymaker, you should actually be scratching your head and saying, wait a second, containment and deterrence, is that so great for me? In other words, it's another kind of threat, right, to say to the Iranians, look, here's the way back to the treaty, and here's the way forward to an, to a, to an end game that looks like the Soviet end game, right? Why do you think you're stronger than the Soviets? I and mean, they might, right? But why do you think you're stronger? Why do you think you're more, you're more patient, right? You know, our side has the money. Our side has the technology. Our side has control of the sea. What exactly do you have that's, that makes it so wonderful for you to live inside this ring, right? So the ring of containment and deterrence itself is a kind of a threat, a coercive tool to try and drive them back towards the treaty, right? Now, just to be clear here, 
I think the people who were thinking this way are, are, are a limited subset of the people who are negotiating this. And I think the general desire on the part of the US government, the European governments, and others is not to bring the Iranians back into the treaty, permitting them to do some enrichment. It's to bring them back into the treaty without any enrichment, without any, uh, I've only talked about enrichment here, but also without any pl plutonium reprocessing, which is another path to a bomb, that all of those capabilities associated with a full fuel cycle will not be permitted in Iran's case. You could, you'll be in the treaty, it's just that you by your actions have hived off a particular set of capacities that say the Japanese are allowed to have, but you are not allowed to have, period, or at least not for 20 years or 30 years or 50 years. That's the objective, right, of current policy. And I don't think it's achievable, but back there. Uh, uh, bearing in mind what happened um, in the July 2009 elections, and uh, would, would it be possible uh, if, or if um, Ahmadinejad was in, in power when uh, a successful nuclear program was developed for a successful regime transfer um, after that? Or would it just sort of solidify Ahmadinejad's uh, place and regime and make it even more difficult for any kind of opposition party to ever successfully you know, win elections and get gain control of Iranian society? I don't think, I've never heard of a nuclear weapon being used as an internal deterrent, right? In other words, you can't really threaten to use it against your own country. Um, uh, what it does do is it makes it harder for outsiders to talk about, um, let's use, say, a bad pigs kind of analogy, right? You'll have an internal uprising and then outsiders will come to the rescue and somehow the combination of insiders and outsiders will somehow, or outsiders will attack and insiders will rebel or something, right? It takes the outside attack game, it's direct outside attack game out of the equation. It probably doesn't take subversion out of the equation. There's things you can do on, on the QT. It probably doesn't take that out of the equation. Where it may matter in this case is whether or not the regime is able to use its um, supposed uh, um, technological achievements as a tool to show its, its nationalist credentials and as a way to argue in terms of domestic politics, look at all we've achieved. These opposition people, what, you know, why, why would you support them, right? Now, they've tried that, and it's, I don't think it's really had much effect. But I, I don't really, I don't know that much about the Iranian opposition. I, it's my understanding that Iranian opposition figures have not said negative things about the nuclear program, nuclear energy program. That's not something that um, they try to make an issue of. And I gather that, you know, that in terms of bits and pieces of argumentation that have come out of sort of the, the followership in the, in the opposition, uh, you know, you, you basically have um, people who are saying, we don't care about nuclear weapons, we don't care about Israel, you know, this campaign against, we don't care about any of this. The fact is you guys have screwed up this country, right? So you can't unscrew this country, but that's another technical term, uh, by sort of, you know, sort of, you know, enriching uranium. Right? You know, wh why, you know, why is it that we flare natural gas in this country, which I believe they still do. Does somebody here know the Iranian energy business? I, I think they flare gas, isn't that right? I, I think they do. This, this is like crazy in this day and age. I mean, it's, you know, because they don't have the technology to basically pipe it back into the ground and save it for something else, right? Uh, they don't have the LNG technology to, you know, bottle it up and send it to somebody, right? Um, uh, it's, they're, they're, their, their, their energy plant, their, their whole plant for getting oil out of the ground and shipping it is old, right? Um, all of this is caused by this policy of theirs, right? And there's a lot of people, younger people in Iran who basically can look at this regime and say, well, yeah, you know, you did something good 20 years ago, but what have you done lately? And there's lots more of us now and you're doing nothing for us, right? You know, they've had a baby boom, right? I mean, at the time of the Iranian revolution, were there 40, 45 million Iranians, were there 70 million now? Who knows the population of Iran? Right? Huh? Yeah. All these young people, right? They need lives. This government's not giving them lives, right? So I don't see how the nuclear, I mean, there, there's a kind of a, a, a kind of a, a emotional flip you get from the fact, hey, you know, here's this technology that these other guys did, we can do it too. But 
what's it turning into? It's not, it doesn't take you anywhere. It's not like it's going to generate magical reactors that are going to make electricity as cheap as hell, partly because the Iranians actually don't have very much fission material, very much raw uranium in the ground, actually, right? They're going to end up having to import that stuff if they really do what they say they're going to do. So I, I don't see how this is going to work for them all that well, work for the regime all that well. I don't, I don't see how this is going to have that much of an effect on the problem that, that you said. Um, over there. Just uh, expounding on uh, Kunal's point about the Revolutionary Guard, can you speak to the, the relationship between the Revolutionary Guard and, the, and the, the ruling clerics on the mullahs and whether or not their goals are in line? Uh, I know you spoke to their, their sort of vague nature and, and how, uh, how they interact, but whether or not they were, who, who would be in charge of the bomb should they get it and where they would go from that? And uh, just as well, you spoke mostly from the U.S. point of view. I wonder how you would view the problem from the Israeli point of view, because um, with the U.S. it's more of a sphere of influence, whereas with Israel it's an exist existential threat. So I don't think that you'd be as comfortable with a um, deterrence and a deterrence policy as as most Israelis would be. So. Okay, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps. Um, I, first of all, I'm gonna. I'm gonna sort of give one of these truth and advertising things. I, I'm not an Iran expert. I've always been a generalist in this business, and every time I pick up a new problem, only so, I can only get so deeply into it. So this is a good question to be researched. And I've, I've spent a few minutes on it, but, and, and Jim has spent more time on it. Jim, who was here before Walsh. Um, the Revolutionary Guards Corps is very close to the clerics, right? They're considered to be really the the guardians of clerical rule. And nominally, their code, whatever that means, is that the, the clerics rule, and they take their orders from them. They're not meant to have their own ideas. They're meant to take their orders from the clerics. The Revolutionary Guards Corps has apparently been intimately involved with the nuclear energy program. This last little uh, um, uh, underground uh, um, facility that they, they hadn't put the centrifuges in, but that they, they, they built for that in Coombe, I believe was an IRGC base. I think that was an IRGC base in Coombe, right? So it's very clear that, that IRGC is intimately involved with the regime and intimately involved with the, with the nuclear program. If there's ever a nuclear, any nuclear weapons, it's almost surely IRGC guys are going to have control of them, right? Now, the question that's being asked is, is the IRGC developing a kind of agenda of its own, right? That, that's a question that, that observers are asking, and I'm not competent to answer it. Right. But are they developing an agenda of their own? What is this agenda? And depending on what the agenda is, is it bad or good for us? For example, if the IRGC is, is moving in the direction of most ruling classes, which is say it's really become a kind of a mafia like the Soviet Communist Party was in the end, then this is probably good for us, right? Because um, they're going to be more interested in feathering their own nests and protecting their power than they are going to be in adventurers, right? And the last thing you're going to want is a nuclear adventure, right? If, on the other hand, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps is somehow some cult-like phenomenon, right, of people who are, you know, uh, mixed, you know, who are sort of holier than holy somehow, and are particularly, you know, oriented on a on a on a set of interpretations within Shia Islam um, uh, that sort of has this uh, apocalyptic view, then this could be a very bad thing, right? Now, the evidence so far is that these guys are just hardball political animals, right, who uh, are trying to increase Iran's power in the region, increase their own power in Iran, lock in the clerics' rule. Uh, they clearly believe that the clerics' view of how Iran should be governed is somehow better or superior to something that would be more westernized or more liberal. And I put, say, more because I, I think the challengers themselves are still um, Persians, Iranians, Muslims, right? Uh, but uh, whether or not there's a, you know, the IRGC is in the saddle and the clerics are not anymore, knows that there, knows what is the politically legitimating story that they tell themselves every morning, right? And that comes into play in every, when, when there's a policy issue to be settled? I have no idea. One thing I, you can amuse yourself doing is, uh, I, I once went to the BBC, BBC collects all kinds of interesting information. I went to the BBC website and somewhere they had one of these graphics sort of trying to explain Iranian decision making, right? You know, who plays and what they are. It's incomprehensible, 
right? I mean, I commend it to you. And I'm not saying this to sort of make light of Iranian politics. Uh, it's very complicated political system, which with a whole bunch of different players and institutions. But it appears that the clerics hold all the high cards. But there's lots of players, right? Um, and lots of checks and I think lots of in, weird internal checks and balances. You asked me about Israel, how the Israelis see this. Uh, you know, the Israelis, you know, when I wrote my piece in the New York Times, most of the, my nastier emails came from Israelis. Right? And nasty, not even the right word. You know, we're just really heartfelt ones, people who were sort of just terrified, right? Um, and, uh, you know, when I reminded them that, you know, you're a nuclear weapon state and all the rest of us know it, don't you? Uh, and you know you, you made decisions, and I, I happened, you know, I, I was sort of raised to be a pro-Israeli guy. I am kind of a pro-Israeli guy. I go to Israel about every couple of years. I have friends in the Israeli military, academics, whatnot, right? Uh, and I knew they were, you know, getting nuclear weapons. And personally, I thought it was just fine, right? I'll just be really honest with you, right? They had reasons, just fine. And I, my attitude was, this day would come, right? Um, so the day has come, and now they have to live, you know, they made a decision to live in this world. If years ago they wanted to sort of try and create a non-proliferation regime in the Middle East that was highly, highly legitimate, then they ought not to have gone down the road that they went down, right? And I tried to explain to them, so yes, the Iranians, a handful of nuclear weapons is very bad for Israel, right? Very bad, it's the end, right? But nuclear weapons are so horrible. The whole reason you're afraid of them are reasons why I think the Iranians should be afraid of them and will be afraid of them. And you have lots of them. And it doesn't take much to ruin this country, right? It's about, I think Daryl and I talked about it once. We looked into it once. There's six or seven or eight population and economic centers in Iran, right? Two or three reasonably large fission weapons. The Israelis have a couple hundred. And almost all of Iran's wealth and management capability is gone. It doesn't kill that many people, not that many, only about 15 or 20 percent of the population in this horrible arithmetic of nuclear war, right? But it's the end of Iran as a country. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know whether it matters to these people or whether they've thought it through, but um, can Shiism survive a catastrophe of this magnitude? <laughs> Right? I mean, as if, if these people really are religiously motivated, right? How, how does that view of the religion even survive a catastrophe of this magnitude, a self-induced catastrophe of this magnitude? So it's it's the end of the Persia as a catch, carrier of culture. It's, I think it's the end of Shiism. It's the end of millions of lives. And by the way, when the Iranians talk about nuclear weapons, they claim they have a fatwa against them. Khamenei claims to have issued a fatwa against nuclear weapons, and just reaffirmed the other day, we're not trying to get nuclear weapons. Now he could be telling the truth. Right? They may have decided, we live in a tough neighborhood, we have to be a near nuclear weapon state in case we want to decide later, but we're not doing this now. It's possible, I don't know. Right? Um, so I say to the Israelis, look, I, I, you know, I, I, know, I, I do know where they're coming from. Right? I've been studying the place for years. I've been going there since 1975. Right? Um, I used to study the Israeli military. Right? And like many American Jews of my generation, I was raised on Holocaust stories. Right? You know, it's in my blood. Right? So, but I'm also a deterrence theorist and a strategist. And I said, look, you, you guys, Amenei Dujad talks a good, crazy game. He talks crazy well, right? It's true, right? And it's very annoying, right? Um, uh, I, I find the man so distasteful. I was asked to have dinner with the man I, I wouldn't. I, I, in fact, was asked, and I declined, right? Um, I, I, find him, I find it that distasteful, the things he says, right? Um, but, Right? This country seems to want to go on. This regime seems to want to create an Islamic society. They seem, when they use violence, to use it, as I said, in a kind of a cagey way. You know, they'll poke, and then if things look tough, they back up. Right? They were very cagey in what they seem to have done in Iraq. Right? And in other times as well. Right? Uh, they made one humongous blunder. They got themselves into a war with Iraq. And after half a million or a million dead, Khomeini, the father, you know, the, the, the grand old man of this whole world said, you know, maybe this is enough, right? Half a million to a million, maybe enough. So these people know a little something about military catastrophe at this point. So I think they are a deterrable group when it comes to sort of, you know, somebody wake up in the morning and say, I got a feeling today is the day. 
I don't think they're going to have that feeling, partly because I think the Israelis are incredibly strong. And um, I think everybody knows, ferocious, right? I mean, the Israelis fought to get to the place that they're in, and uh, they did it successfully. And, you know, like some other countries who have literally fought to get where they are, there's some mileage that comes from having that history. You know, Finland, uh, they fought the Russians tooth and nail in 1939, got beat, went back into the war on the side of the Nazis, fought the Russians again to get their land back, got beat, ended up lo lost the land, lost the Karelian Isthmus to the Soviets. The Soviets didn't invade them. Any, you know, basically said, look, this, this, there's some nuts that are too tough to crack, right? Um, you know, the Cold War, the Finns had a Western-style society. They just didn't bother the Soviets in a foreign policy sense. Well, the Israelis are pretty tough customers. They've proven it. I don't think the Iranians have a doubt in their mind what's going to happen if they pull a stunt like this. Right? There's no reason for them to have such a doubt. I don't think there's any evidence they have such a doubt. Right? Um, and you know, the icing on the cake is the Israelis can talk a good game about sort of mounting an air raid, and they can. right? They can do an interesting attack. They'll have a celebration the next morning, and a year later we'll be back where we were. Right? Um, so I don't think they can solve the problem. What they really want to do is get us to solve it in the way that they would solve it if they were us, right? which I don't think we're going to do.